the megapodes are this, this, this really small group of birds, closely related to, to chooks and quail and, and, and birds like that, but they've done something very, very odd in the bird world, and that is that they use external sources of heat to incubate their eggs. There's only about 20 species, seven basic types in the world, and they're all in northern Australia and the islands just to the north of Australia through Indonesia. So they're really a, an oddity. And there are about 10,000 species of birds on this planet. No other species uses external heat. All the others use body heat. The Mallee fowl belongs to an extraordinary family and it is the most extraordinary member of that family. Birds such as the Australian brush turkey scrape together a whole lot of leaf litter and let it slowly rot because they're in very, very moist environments. And if they scrape together a whole lot of leaf litter, it, it rots. And then they go and they have a look and they find a warm spot. The, the Mallee fowl has taken it another step, or actually another couple of steps. It also rakes up leaf litter, but what makes it unusual is that it's the only megapode to live in an arid environment. And just scraping up a whole lot of leaf litter wouldn't do very much at all because it would just dry out. So what the Mallee fowl does is it first excavates a hole, fills it with leaf litter, and then waits until that leaf litter is completely drenched with water. And then it locks in all that water with a layer of sand over the top. And that prevents the leaf litter from drying out and it starts to decompose and generate heat. And then the birds dig down and lay in that warm, warm sand. In autumn, a pair of Mallee fowl will typically be walking around and every now and then the male sees a bit of a hole or perhaps a, a, a mound, a previously used mound of Mallee fowl and it'll go up there and, and it'll do a display and the female will come over and have a look and more often than not just keep walking. But when she finds the right mound then they'll start, start work and they'll dig it out so that it's this big cone into the earth it could be up to a metre deep. There's a big cone into the earth with a square box down the bottom. And then the birds start to rake all the leaf litter and they work in a line. So they won't necessarily just take the closest leaf litter. What they're actually doing is they're going to form a windrow. And they're going to walk back and forward on this line of, of leaf litter until the whole thing slowly edges its way into the mound. So this takes, can take weeks and weeks. They just rake it all in until they may have up to a cubic metre of leaf litter. And they're, they're waiting for a, a big rain. One last, you know, big rain to absolutely saturate all that leaf litter. When it occurs, they will quickly cover the whole thing in and lock in all of that moisture. And that's where the magic really starts. Because the moisture is locked in, although it's bone dry outside, and it starts to rot. And as it rots, it produces heat, and the birds start digging down, checking the temperature, and as they do this, they're forming this, this plug of loose sand going into the leaf litter, and we call that the, nesting, the nest chamber. So this plug of, of loose sand, dry loose sand, surrounded by rotting leaf litter. So surrounded by warmth. If you look closely at a, uh, a, particularly the male, but also the female going into the mound, what they do is they, they shove their head in and they take a, a, a billful of sand. So presumably they have temperature sensitive membranes in their bill to, to measure the temperature of the sand. They might move a tonne of soil a day just opening and closing this mound. So when they're down there, they'll, they'll check the temperature and if it's too hot, then in the early morning they, they open up the mound and let the heat escape to the atmosphere. So even in, even in summer it can get very fiercely hot in the Mallee but the morning is pretty cool. So by opening up they can release a lot of that heat and cool the whole mass down. Later on the, the challenge is to warm the mound and then they use an entirely different strategy. Later on in the season they open it later in the morning and they lay all the sand out. And then as the, sand, the surface of the sand heats in the sun, they scrape that into the center and then leave it for a while, let the surface heat up again and then scrape it you know, back in. And in that way, they have this big mass of warm, 
you know, quite warm sand above the eggs that then heats the eggs to the required temperature. In terms of the working mound, they'd be about five metres across. And at its height, when the birds are really, you know, mounding it up before a rain or something like that, which can kill all the eggs so that they're very steep and they'll put a lot of sticks on the top as well, they can easily be a metre high. So quite enormous structures, really. These structures, once they're built, are really quite persistent in the landscape. So what mallee fowl tend to do is to go to previous structures that have been used and renovate them. That's not to say they don't also build new mounds, and some birds just like building new mounds, but typically they, they reuse uh, older mounds. Mallee fowl are socially very monogamous. They tend to, to have you know, long-standing pair bonds. That in itself is quite unusual amongst birds, but not totally unusual. What makes it really quite unusual is that the male and female are forced to spend a lot of, the, of their time during the breeding season apart. Usually that wouldn't happen in the animal world because particularly the males will try and guard their female, make sure nobody else you know, gets in there and, 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 and fathers eggs. But mallee fowl have no choice. They're, 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 they've locked into this breeding system and the only way it can work now is if the male stays with the mound and basically maintains the mound, uh, maintains the temperature in the mound, so opening and closing every day. And the female has an equally big challenge and that is to find the food to make her eggs because in the mallee, it's very dry. There's no surface water typically. And yet the eggs are huge. And of course they're full of, 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 of water and they're also full of protein and energy. So the female has to try and find the food to make the eggs. The mallee fowl aren't much bigger than say an Isa brown, a little bit larger with a longer neck, but we're still only talking about a kilo and a half to two kilos. And they produce an egg that is you know, maybe three times the size of a domestic chicken. So a huge mm. egg, around about seven to 10% of the female body weight. And she does this every three days or so. So it's, it's analogous to childbirth, which is I think also roughly in, the, in, the, in that ballpark. Only mallee fowl are producing these eggs every three days. So it, 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 it's a huge investment. Within a season, she may lay two or three times her own body weight in a period of a, of a few months. Unbelievable effort. And this is done largely over spring and summer in the Mallee, which are dry and fierce times. So it is in itself quite, quite astonishing. Mallee fowl, you know, while they're looking after the eggs in the mound, they're doing a brilliant job. Very, very high survivorship. Survivorship of the actual eggs is typically very, very high much higher than it is for, for birds in nests, as a general rule. 70 to 80 per cent is quite, quite normal um, hatching success from, from mallee fowl mounds. And although you would think that things like foxes would quickly get into mounds and gobble up all the eggs, and they do occasionally, the predation on eggs is actually fairly minor. In some years, it, it goes through the roof, and when I say through the roof, they might take a third of the eggs that are laid, but in most years, it'd be under 5% of the eggs that are laid. There are many, many extraordinary things about mallee fowl. Another one of the astonishing things about mallee fowl is they have, once the, the, the chicks come out of the eggs, there's no parental care. When the chicks come out, they, they, they actually dig themselves out, they hatch out, it can be up to a metre you know, under the surface. They have to find their own way out. They're buried in sand. They have the advantage though that the, the male, remember, is, is moving the sand probably every second day, uh, checking the temperature, closing it up again, so it's all loose sand. And the chick has to kind of dig its way out, or if you like, just float its way out, moving and wriggling, so the sand keeps going underneath it, finds its way out, quite comically sometimes, rolls down the side, because by this stage it hasn't walked yet and it can't often walk, can't stand up. But the damn thing can run and can run really fast and can even fly on the first day. 
uh, usually quite low to the ground. So these are really well formed chicks that come out with no parental care and the Mallee is a pretty inhospitable place in summer. So these chicks, you'd think the chances of them surviving are, are very, very low. And in fact, the survivorship is very, very low, but it's a system that seems to work very well. Things sort of go wrong, or at least they get, they get hard for a baby mallee fowl when it leaves the mound. It still has some yolk in the belly. So in a sense, it's got a, you know, I like to say it's got a little cut lunch for a couple of days, and it's got two or three days to find food. And if it doesn't find sufficient food in that two to three days, it's going to go hungry. And that means that it'll eventually starve, and quite a few chicks starve. Or it'll be picked off by predators because it's out looking for food. Whereas a chick that has found food will rest most of the day. And they just disappear. Mallee fowl have the most fantastic camouflage. Um, they will completely disappear in the leaf litter and just come out for an hour a day to, to eat and then go back and grow. Those first few months are not just about survival, they're also about learning. There's a reason why the birds that get through are so tough, and that is because they've gone through a really tough initiation. The average life expectancy of a mallee fowl is probably about two to three weeks. Most of the chicks die. Most of the chicks die because it's a terribly harsh environment and full of predators. Everything's out to get them for quite a while. If they do survive the first six months, then once they get to adult size, you know, of a year or so, they, they seem to be pretty good for quite a few years. They seem to live in the wild. Our best estimate is, you know, 15 to 20 years. And we're just talking here of breeding birds. So 15 to 20 years, you know, average life for a, a you know, breeding bird is pretty good. Populations are slipping. And we know that, we've measured it. Um, populations are slipping even in habitat that hasn't been cleared or altered. In the wheat belts of Australia that once contained some of the best mallee fowl habitat, most of that habitat is all gone. The biggest threats now are the introduced, the invasive species that, are, that we brought in. Foxes in particular are a great concern, but cats are also a, a great concern. And then a lot of the introduced herbivores. Goats are a, a major problem in a lot of areas, but also sheep and, and rabbits, and, and we have pigs encroaching on other areas and deer encroaching on other areas. The herbivores can make a very, very strong negative impact because they eat the same food that mallee fowl eat. There's actually quite a long list of threats. Fire is a big one. While fire has always been part of the Australian landscape and is, is certainly part of the ecology of the Mallee, huge fires will take out a lot of Mallee fowl country and a lot of Mallee fowl very, very suddenly. And that becomes important because the, the continuity of the habitat has all been broken up. We now have these, 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 these blocks of varying sizes but many of them can be taken out by one fire. The biggest concern for the future is climate change because that changes everything. If the rain, even if, if the same amount of rain, you know, comes in the future, if it's distributed in the summer rather than the winter when mallee fowl need it to make their mounds, it'll have a big impact on breeding. So everything that the mallee fowl does is tuned to the environment that it has been living in for, for many, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Any changes could have big impacts, not only on mallee fowl, of course, but on all of us. Mallee fowl need rain at much the same time as the wheat farmers do. We, all we are all part of an intricate web. I think it was when I started working in Central Australia that I really started to understand how incredibly tough these birds are. You sometimes get the, the, the impression that uh, an endangered species is somehow fragile, you know, vulnerable itself, kind of, you know, um, it makes it sound like it's a very, very fragile, delicate thing that has to be kind of nursed. Um, mallee fowl are anything but fragile. They are tough as nails. They are amazingly tough birds. 
particularly in the Mallee, is a harsh environment. Go there, you know, when it's sort of 40, 45 degrees and there's no water and spend the day without any water contemplating what it would be like to come out as a chick. And this is the first view of the world. You've just popped out and you have the most amazing challenge in front of you. So it's not so much that they are the, these delicate creatures that have to be nursed, but rather there, there are so many things being thrown at them that we just have to try and lighten the load if we want to keep them for the future. And for this truly unique and special bird, I think resoundingly across the country, you know, whether it be farmers or city people or whatever, everybody seems to have a soft spot for mallyfowl. Um, they're, they're sort of quite, you know, and, and unobtrusive. Uh, they don't destroy crops or anything like that. They just go about their business, work extremely hard, and um, people really, really like them. You know, quite apart from the extraordinary things that they do, uh, they're very, um, you know, they're, they're very endearing birds.